Um, it's time to move on to our next uh, presenter, which is uh, Mike Vieira from Manitoba Hydro. Mike is a civil engineer in the water resources department at Manitoba Hydro, and he joined uh, Manitoba Hydro in 2010 and completed a part-time Master of Science degree in 2016. Um, his graduate research focused on climate change impacts to extreme hydrological events, including multi-year droughts. Michael has led technical climate studies for Manitoba Hydro on topics related to hydrology, energy demand, resource planning, infrastructure resilience, and in support of regulatory processes and licensing. Michael collaborates with researchers to improve applicability of climate and hydrological science to the engineering community and to meet Manitoba Hydro's needs. So I'm looking forward to your presentation, Mike. Uh, do you wanna go ahead and take it away? Sure, thank you. Uh, maybe if you could just confirm that you can hear me and see my screen, that would be great. I can hear you and I can see your screen. Okay, fantastic. So hello everyone, my name is Mike Vera, and uh, as Marco mentioned, I'm a civil engineer in the water resources department at Manitoba Hydro. I'd like to thank you all for tuning into today's session and special thanks to Marco for the invitation to present and also special thanks to Kurt for your excellent presentation. So my talk today is on my experience assessing climate change resilience for electrical infrastructure, which I think carries the torch nicely from Kurt's talk. So I've divided my talk into five main topics. Uh, these are some background information on Manitoba Hydro, uh, some of our climate change strategies, and a climate change opportunities, risks, and adaptation working group that we're, we're working on. We abbreviate it as CORA. Uh, and then I'll spend a little bit more time talking about climate change resilience assessment processes and some illustrative examples. Okay, so fitting for our first background segment, I like to set the stage with some company highlights. Manitoba Hydro is an electrical and natural gas utility involved in electricity generation, transmission and distribution to customers. Uh, on average, more than 97% of our electrical energy is generated from hydropower and we serve over 600,000 electricity customers and over 290,000 natural gas customers. Our fleet consists of 17 generating stations, 16 of which are hydroelectric, uh, and that includes the newly constructed Kiosk Generating Station in northern Manitoba. And we have one thermal generating station since we announced the decommissioning of a second thermal plant uh, just last year. Uh, we also purchase power from two independent wind power producers who generate wind energy in southern Manitoba, and those are the two yellow dots you can sort of see on the map there. Uh, and in order to move all of this electricity, we operate tens of thousands of kilometers of transmission and distribution lines across the province, as you can see from the figure. Uh, and then speaking of, you know, this large geographic extent, it's worth noting that we participate in electricity markets outside of Manitoba. And the water that fuels our hydro generating stations comes from the Nelson Churchill watershed, which spans an area of roughly 1.4 million square kilometers. So in a nutshell, we have lots of infrastructure covering a large landscape sitting out there taking whatever the environment will throw at it. And uh, not surprisingly, our business is sensitive to weather and climate. So we recognize that increasing temperatures can affect other environmental processes such as precipitation and wind patterns among others. And because we operate in an environment that is sensitive to weather and climate, we're interested in understanding how climate change might impact things like our energy supply, our energy demand, our infrastructure design and management, environmental assessments, human resources, and customer service. Uh, and just to note a few examples of this sensitivity, uh, in any given year, our annual net income could fluctuate by hundreds of millions of dollars if we were to compare a very dry year to a very favorable water year. Uh, and just two years ago in October of 2019, we experienced a wet snow event which had a financial impact of roughly $100 million. So beyond our internal interests, which include delivering safe, reliable energy at the lowest possible cost and managing risks along the way, there's some broader industry and social changes uh, that also drive the need for climate resilience and adaptation. Uh, these include changing codes and standards, which we know are evolving to better position infrastructure built today to withstand the climate of the future. Uh, and this is accomplished through updating design values and approaches available to practitioners through various 
codes and standards associations, including Standards Council of Canada, uh, the Canadian Standards Association, and the International Organization for Standardization, among many others. Uh, and just as an example, if you were to leaf through the preface of the 2021 Electrical Code, part one, uh, you'll notice that uh, there were some revisions made in support of climate change adaptation through several sections of the code. Uh, and then finally, we know for a fact that climate change is on the radar of our stakeholders and our regulators. And we know this because we've been asked some really good questions in regulatory forums related to climate change and what we are doing about it. So we expect this to continue and possibly even grow as the public becomes more climate conscious. Uh, when it comes to the electricity they rely on, the products and services they purchase, and even in the investments they make. Uh, and this uh, photo on the bottom is from environmental hearings for the Kiosk Generating Station circa 2013, uh, which, as you may have guessed, uh, climate change was certainly a topic of interest. So our climate change work is not just a, a recent endeavor, and this slide shows a, a brief evolution. You know, we've always understood our reliance on hydrology and the close link to climate conditions. So with the establishment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, in 1988, and then their first assessment report a few years later, climate change science was in the spotlight and data were in closer reach to practitioners. So my chart here starts in the 1980s, where 1989 dates the earliest climate change study I can find in Manitoba Hydro. Uh, so I'm quite comfortable saying that climate change has been on our radar since the 1980s, maybe a bit of a stretch, but I think we, we qualify. Uh, and then in the 1990s, there was continued interest in climate change from a physical impact perspective, as well as a contributions perspective, which led to our first report of greenhouse gas emissions. So as our understanding grew, research questions emerged and organizations were engaged to learn more about specific topics. Uh, some of this earlier R&D work related to higher risk items like drought um, and using tree rings, for example, to do so. Uh, this was really underscored in the 2000s when we experienced a, a very low flow event throughout our system. Uh, and this was also when environmental hearings took place for the Wasquatam Generating Station, which has since been constructed. Uh, during these hearings, we were asked about climate change and we realized we had some room for improvement, which prompted us to further our studies. To help address these gaps, we became an affiliated member of the Uranus Consortium and we began building our internal bench strength to carry out climate change studies. Um, in 2008, we began a, a public designed report to help communicate our strategies. Um, and that brings us into the 2010s, where we published our first and second climate change report, which are the two on well, the left report and in the middle report there on the bottom of the figure. And we found that these were, were very useful engagement tools. At the end of this decade, we kicked off a new climate change working group, which I'll discuss later. And here we are in the 2020s, where we've published a new climate change report, that third one or the, the right hand side figure there. Uh, and we've made progress towards climate change adaptation uh, and planning, which is close, closely linked with, uh, with resilience. So at the core of these climate change reports are five strategies which help shape our response to climate change. Uh, they are number one, to understand the changing climate, number two, to report our greenhouse gas emissions, number three, to contribute to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, number four, to support greenhouse gas policy, and number five, adapt and plan for the changing climate. So in a normal presentation, I dive deeper into topics one and five, uh, but for number one, I often speak to our collaboration with groups like Oranis, uh, and I'd be preaching to the choir today. So I'll focus more on topic five, and specifically how we might apply data such as those provided by Aranis in our work. Uh, but with that said, I'm very passionate about our understand strategy. So just one slide to underscore a few points which are probably obvious to everyone tuned in. Uh, first, we're interested in spatial scales that are most relevant to us uh, because as we know, warming varies regionally. Uh, one common notion is that northern regions are warming faster than the rest of the planet, and we certainly see that pattern projected to continue. Uh, if we reflect on the Paris Agreement in 2015 and the 2 degrees Celsius target, which was set for global mean temperatures, uh, we can look at how local mean temperatures change, or LMT as abbreviated on the figure, um, and how that scales with respect to global mean temperature change. So here I used a, an ensemble of 40 global climate model simulations and found that Winnipeg, our capital in Manitoba, 
is projected to warm at about 1.7 times the global rate. So that two degrees Celsius target, if achieved, translates into different values depending on your region of interest. So there's a lot of averaging that goes into these numbers, which arguably make them easier to digest, but perhaps less applicable for some applications. Um, in many cases, we're interested in extreme events and not necessarily in annual average conditions. Uh, we're also interested in looking beyond the common variables available from climate models, such as daily temperature and precipitation. So for example, stream flow and events where we have precipitation occurring near zero degrees Celsius that are coincident with high wind speeds, uh, those have particular utility in some of the engineering we do at Manitoba Hydro. So these challenges can partially be overcome by things like using non-standard climate model outputs, uh, by using regional climate models with sub-daily data, uh, or by using temperature and precipitation scenarios from these climate models to drive other models, which is illustrated on the bottom right-hand figure there. And in this figure, we used uh, the ensemble of 40 global climate model simulations to drive a hydrological model of the Blood Vein River to explore how 30-year average stream flow might change in the future. Uh, the black line here represents baseline conditions and the dark blue line represents the median climate model projection for the 2050s. Uh, it shows a general tendency of the ensemble towards higher winter flows and earlier spring freshet and possibly reduced summer flows. Um, however, behind those lines, you see a much wider blue band, which showcases a, a portion of the uncertainty if you were to select any single climate model simulation. And this concept of uncertainty uh, was already brought up in the chat and introduces a, a much deeper topic that I think is critical in adaptation planning. And, and I'll certainly be touching on that a little bit later. Well, I've seen so many utilities. OK, uh, I think someone's got their mic on, um, just a note. Uh, so. Understanding climate change projections is an absolutely necessary step, but the application lies in, in what we do with that knowledge and, and how we might adapt to climate change, which is our fifth strategy. Now, as you're all aware, uh, there can be a lot of buzzwords when reading literature on climate change adaptation, but I like to focus on two just to help keep things simple. Uh, we've got adaptation, which in essence means adjusting to new conditions, or if you're looking through a climate lens, you might define it as you know, actions that reduce negative impacts of climate change. Uh, and then we have resilience, which is used outside of climate change very widely, uh, but in Infrastructure Canada's climate lens, you might define it as you know, the capacity of a community or business uh, to withstand and recover from a climate change related event with minimal impact. So I think it's important to recognize that resilience is a trait and adaptation is an action. Uh, the two concepts are closely linked and in a nutshell, uh, they have very strong ties to what many practitioners do on a regular basis, which is managing or reducing uh, weather related risk. So in the climate change context, we're just we're acknowledging that the weather might change in the future. So if we focus on the image um, on the right-hand side there, which comes from an Electric Power Research Institute paper, uh, we can imagine that the, the y-axis is some measure, uh, measurable attribute such as system performance. Uh, and then we follow the orange line along the x-axis, which we imagine is time. So we start on the left-hand side from a point of normal, reliable operation, and about a third of the way in, into the chart, we encounter a disruptive event, uh, which reduces system performance to a point below reliable operation. Uh, we spend some time in this state of reduced service, and then we restore the system to a pre-event state. Uh, so in this case, an improvement to resilience through adaptation might include better forecasting to prepare for the event, infrastructure that is designed to handle greater loads, uh, perhaps some system redundancy, or even emergency response systems, which reduce the time it takes to restore that service. So if one wanted to imagine a large scale real world example of this illustration, there certainly are many examples. Um, but the October 2019 wet snow event that I alluded to earlier provides a, a good case study within Manitoba. Okay, so understanding the changing climate and these adaptation concepts, they're important, but uh, this knowledge alone doesn't get us to the point of adaptation. So how do we actually execute this fifth strategy of ours? And uh, our determination was to form an internal working group and we called it CORA. Uh, 
So CORE stands for Climate Change Opportunities, Risks, and Adaptation, and the group intends to identify and explore climate-related risks more holistically throughout the corporation. Uh, the image on the right is illustrative and shows some of the groups and business functions that are represented. Uh, and while we recognize that a broad definition of climate change risk may include topics like those that are transitional, such as changes in technology, policy, and markets. Um, but it's worth noting that CORE intends to focus on the physical risks associated with climate change. Uh, that might be a slow onset or chronic temperature change event uh, or acute events like an extreme windstorm. Um, such an initiative also requires uh, management support for resource allocation and direction. And uh, we're very lucky to have leadership in our corporation that recognizes the importance of this topic. Uh, such an initiative also requires a diverse team. So at Manitoba Hydro, that means reaching out to professionals involved in electrical engineering, civil engineering, environmental assessments, asset management, risk management, load forecasters, reservoir managers, uh, among others with duties ranging from design to operations to long-term planning. And then finally, as a, a shameless plug for our group, I think it's important to have some climate science expertise as part of the team. Uh, so as an engineer, uh, this meant developing skills beyond the normal curriculum to better understand some concepts of atmospheric sciences and, and climate change topics. Um, in many cases, ambient temperature conditions or a rainfall amount may simply be looked up in a code or standard and then applied in design, perhaps without a thorough understanding of um, uh, the assumptions made behind that value. So having some form of climate science expertise can go a long way in uh, digesting the, the seemingly infinite amount of climate change information that is available. Okay, so Quora is relatively new, I would say, but we do have some progress to report. Uh, it all started in 2018, where we initiated discussions on climate adaptation at an internal workshop. And uh, Isabel Sharon and Alain Borcou came to Winnipeg, and they actually made a big impact on our executive. Uh, so after the workshop, we received direction to establish Cora, which was kicked off in 2019. Uh, and then we circulated a survey to collect information for an initial risk assessment. Uh, and because this was a first step, we didn't adopt a very complex risk framework. Uh, instead, we used something very simple, uh, like a three by three matrix with low, medium, and high, as shown on the right. So we've got likelihood category and an impact category. And uh, of course, there's several embedded perspectives that may include financial system reliability, among others. But again, a very simple framework. So throughout 2019 and 2020, we engaged with subject matter experts within and beyond Cora to refine survey feedback and improve consistency across the board. Uh, and now we're at a point of processing survey feedback and beginning early stages of a corporate-wide adaptation plan. Uh, and in the foreseeable future, we intend to start working on some of the high priority topics that are identified as part of this work. Okay, so at the same time that Cora was ramping up, uh, our group was also contacted to lead a climate change resilience assessment in support of an application for federal funding. So with respect to Cora's progress, um, this request was a bit disruptive, but in fact, switching gears made sense for at least three reasons. Uh, number one, it was an opportunity to test out what we had already kind of developed within Cora and refine the process. Uh, number two, we were able to engage a, a broader audience outside of CORE, so additional subject matter experts that we wouldn't have otherwise engaged. Uh, and number three, the most obvious, is there was an opportunity to seek some available funding from Infrastructure Canada. And to do so, we uh, followed Infrastructure Canada's Climate Lens Guidance, which is uh, pictured here on the right. Uh, this is a 2018 version, and uh, there are some changes, uh, and it's available online now. So in a nutshell, uh, this is very much a risk assessment 101 process. Uh, generally speaking, it's outlined very simply in the ISO 31000 risk management guidelines. Um, there are some tweaks and some specific considerations in ISO 14090 and 14091, which are specific to climate change adaptation. And my understanding is much like 31000 has been adopted uh, at CSA, this is likely going to be the case for those other two ISO standards at some point in the future. Uh, but there's many, many others examples. Uh, so 
you can use the Infrastructure Canada Climate Lens. It's got a, a very basic risk assessment process within that document. You might use the PIEVC protocol. Uh, there's some documentation from the Canadian Electricity Association, from the International Hydropower Association, uh, from the CREDA document that Kurt mentioned. Uh, but again, in a nutshell, the assessment process doesn't change drastically and it's risk assessment 101. So risk is a function of impact and likelihood. But if we elaborate on risk assessment 101, we might call the next lesson, you know, uh, maybe risk assessment 201 or 102 if you prefer, uh, when we look specifically at climate change risk. So the overall approach is similar. Um, risk is still a function of impact and likelihood, but we have other important considerations. So we also add some resolution compared to the matrix I showed a few slides back. Uh, and in this case, I show five impact categories and six likelihood categories, which is more consistent with the climate lens guidance. I don't want to get hung up on details. Uh, such as the category names and associated numbers behind those categories. Uh, but generally, there are numeric quantities behind the names. Uh, and I've shown some example return periods to go with the likelihoods. Uh, what's important to note is that we assume the impact category does not change in time, and we focus on the likelihood category. So specifically, we focus on two measures of likelihood, one for the historic period and one for the future period of interest. Uh, and then we accompany this likelihood with a measure of confidence in the direction of the projected change. Now, there are several ways you might do this. Uh, IPCC provides some guidance, uh, but for today's presentation, I'm showing information adapted from a 2020 report by Environment and Climate Change Canada, led by Alex Cannon, uh, which helps characterize future projected changes as either tier one, when there's high confidence, tier two, when there's medium confidence, and tier three, when there is low confidence. Uh, so the report also provides some guidance on how uh, one might apply such information, be it in design or sensitivity analyses. And we find this uh, a pretty good communication means when we're talking with, uh, with other design engineers. So this type of information is important and might help us as practitioners decide whether the climate change risk is acceptable or unacceptable. Uh, we might ask how confident are we in the projected change or perhaps more directly, uh, do we have actionable climate science that is suitable for the purpose at hand? Um, and off the cuff, uh, one might think that a tier one or a robust signal is needed for actionable climate science. Uh, and I think that robust signals definitely help, uh, but there's more to it. Uh, you see, if we find conflicting results, the action might be to explore the topic deeper. And if we find projections that are indistinguishable from natural climate variability, well, the action might be to invest resources into understanding what that range of natural variability really looks like, uh, perhaps through studies such as those involving uh, paleo records. Okay, so now that we've graduated Risk Assessment 101 and Risk Assessment 201, this figure illustrates uh, how the climate change resilience assessment process might actually unfold in practice. Uh, generally, we'll have some form of a request come in and a project initiation. From here, we'll work with a project manager to assign subject matter experts involved in various project components and we'll hold a kickoff meeting. This meeting serves as a means to introduce the climate change resilience assessment process and undertake a risk identification exercise, typically an open discussion to educate and make sure we've identified the climate events that may pose some risk to the project. And when I say educate, I mean two ways. One, the climate science going out and two, the infrastructure specific details coming in. So from here, our group will, will get to work analyzing historic data and future projections, and we'll provide information to subject matter experts. And then from here, we collectively look at likelihoods, impacts, along with other items like tolerance, uncertainties, and use of professional judgment uh, to help interpret that risk. Uh, this is a, a great opportunity to discuss existing systems that are in place to manage weather-related risks that may be relevant in a climate change context. Uh, but if risks are deemed unacceptable, we can then look at features that can make the project more resilient to climate change. And then finally, we document the process. So we've actually applied this process a few times now, and examples below intend to illustrate some of the applications where the climate resilience process can be applied to electrical infrastructure. Uh, the first example is a project to construct 
uh, a new 230 kilovolt transmission line for export opportunity. Uh, the second example is to install additional generation capacity and an existing hydropower facility to better utilize water resources available at the site. And the third example is a project that bundles a few different projects. So the construction of a new 230 kilovolt transmission line uh, and a new electrical station, as, as well as some other distribution improvements to improve capacity in a specific area of the province. So these three examples share some similarities, including um, you know, proven reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, however, the second one is unique in two respects. Uh, one, it requires a more thorough understanding of hydrological change, water supply and floods. Uh, and number two, the assumptions about the asset life may be different than new infrastructure. So from a climate change resilience perspective, perhaps the time frame of interest is a little a little sooner, I suppose, like the 2050s instead of the 2080s. Uh, and that can be an important element in the assessment, or at least with respect to the future projections that we provide as a group. But regardless of the future time period, uh, an initial meeting with the project manager and SMEs will involve populating a table such as this one. So I've simply shown a sample of climate events and risk topics that may or may not be applicable to a specific project, uh, but such a table can provide a starting point for discussion. Now, I, I don't intend to go through this list extensively, uh, but I'd just like to note that we typically look at a number of unique climate events related to atmospheric, terrestrial, and hydrological variables. Uh, and we include topics that may directly relate to design and operation of specific project components, as well as topics that pertain more so to systemic risks, uh, potentially affecting broader aspects of our electrical system, and then possibly indirectly affecting the project. So that previous slide had uh, about 13 climate events and about 20 risk topics, uh, but we don't have time to discuss each one in isolation. So instead, I've selected two examples here to walk through in greater detail. So let's just imagine that we're conducting an assessment on a newly proposed transmission line. And we'll look at two risk topics in parallel in a bit of a split screen mode here. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, we have one topic. And on the right-hand side of the screen, we have another topic. Excuse me. So starting with the left hand side, um, we have extreme heat, which can affect transmission line operation, specifically when ambient conditions exceed a design value, reductions in capacity may be required. Or in other words, you may have to dial back the amount of electricity you're transmitting on a given line. And if we move to the right hand side of the screen, uh, we have precipitation that occurs near zero degrees Celsius, which is just a fancy way of saying freezing rain or wet snow or icing events, which can affect transmission line civil design by imposing loads in excess of design values. And these loads could conceivably result in failures of some components. Now, in the background, let's imagine uh, we were subject matter experts and we did some analyses to quantify the impact. Uh, for illustrative purposes, let's arbitrarily say uh, we found this to be a major impact uh, in both cases. And I do this because one, I'm not an expert in transmission line operation or design. And two, because I think the likelihood part of the risk assessment equation is a little bit more interesting from a climate change resilience perspective. So moving on to likelihood, uh, I've retained the split screen view here and I just wanna walk through each of these separately. So starting with the left-hand side, we have extreme heat and we've arbitrarily determined it has a major impact on transmission line operation. Uh, for likelihoods, the subject matter experts have told us that they designed for a one in 50 year maximum temperature event based on historic data. Uh, and this comes from the respective standard. So great, I can work with this. Uh, I pull up MATLAB and start processing data from bias-adjusted ensembles of climate model simulations. Uh, one ensemble from Uranus has 22 scenarios, and I fit the statistical distribution, and I plot probability density functions of historic periods versus future periods. Uh, and from this, I find that that same 50-year historic event is projected to occur more frequently in the future, uh, perhaps with a return period of about 10 years. Uh, and I also find that all of the simulations agree on the direction of this change, that things are getting warmer. So I'm inclined to assign a tier one confidence. Now, uh, just a little caveat, uh, that same SME has also told me that the real impact 
is a function of temperature and the coincident wind speed, uh, which I don't necessarily have the GCM data to assess. So I may be somewhat hesitant to convey a high confidence until I further study is done. On the right-hand side, we have our icing event, which we've arbitrarily determined has a major impact on transmission line civil design. Uh, for likelihoods, the subject matter experts have told us that the standard uh, uses a reference ice and wind design event of one in 50 years, and this is based on historic data. So great, I can work with that. I, I pull up MATLAB and quickly realize, well, I don't have GCM projected annual maximum radial ice accumulation for this given conductor size of interest. How odd. Uh, but joking aside, this actually happens quite often. Uh, the climate variables and thresholds of interest may not necessarily align with standard climate model outputs. So what can we do? Uh, in this case, we had recently completed a, uh, we'd recently partnered with UCAM to study changes in 50 year radial ice accumulation using CRCM5 projections, uh, two of which are shown below. There, there was a third, but I had to cut it out to make room on this slide. Uh, and what we found for Manitoba was areas where there was no change projected, areas where one simulation projected an increase and the other simulation projected a decrease. And ultimately, um, we don't really have reliable evidence to justify a change in the ice accumulation. Uh, and we assign a future probability equal to the historic probability. We also assign a tier three confidence to reflect uncertainty. Um, and in addition, we haven't really looked at the other coincident variables of interest, which is wind pressures acting on that mass of ice growth that's now attached to the conductor. So once we have all this information, we can start populating a summary table to help us with this risk evaluation part of the process. Based on previous slides, we now have the historic likelihood the future likelihood, the confidence in the projected change, and the impact. And from here, um, we, we use our risk rating table to assign a future risk. Uh, for direct project risk, so actual impacts on project infrastructure or operations, we have a moderate and low risk rating for each of these two examples that we've used. But when we consider the broader Manitoba hydroelectrical network, we recognize that the project itself might actually reduce climate change related risk elsewhere on the system. So the project may impose a systemic opportunity. Now for the actual risk evaluation column that right hand side highlighted in yellow, we aim to assign something like acceptable or unacceptable or marginal. And to do so, we require input from subject matter experts, uh, the climate science folks, uh, as well as project managers to appropriately interpret the risk and understand our tolerance to such events. We might ask ourselves, you know, is the historic risk acceptable? Uh, and if so, are we inclined to accept similar risk levels in the future? And finally, we should consider how confident we are in the projected change and whether uh, the expense required to mitigate this risk is justified. Jumping back to our two illustrative examples, I just want to talk through some of the discussions we typically have during the risk evaluation and risk treatment steps of the process. And I apologize for all the text, but there's a lot to cover here. Uh, again, just starting on the left-hand side for extreme heat impacts on transmission line operation, uh, it's important to note that the impact is not purely a function of just temperature. Uh, it really boils down to how hot the conductor can get before it sags and the clearance from some object is violates a given limit, like a safety limit. Uh, this is a function of the ambient temperature, the wind speed at the time, the angle at which the wind hits the conductor, the solar radiation. Uh, it's also a function of um, you know, things like the object underneath the transmission line, whether it's a vehicle or a person or vegetation, and how much electricity is moving through that line, which can in fact be controlled. So if ambient conditions were of concern, one process in place to temp is to temporarily derate the line. And perhaps this is only for a few hours during you know, the most extreme conditions. We might also discuss some other conceptual risk mitigation options, such as revisiting the design ambient conditions or exploring use of dynamic risk ratings, which use um, actual observations to, to operate the system. Uh, we also discuss how extreme heat might affect other existing portions of our electrical system and how this conceptual or illustrative new transmission line can help alleviate strain um, and other existing infrastructure. 
On the right hand side for freezing rain impacts on civil design, we might discuss the role of line orientation as we know that this can make lines more or less susceptible to certain climate events. And what I mean by orientation is whether it's running north to south or east to west. Uh, we may also discuss uh, how we design for a higher reliability level that goes beyond the 50 year reference value from the standard. Uh, and we design for failure containment loads such that if icing were to take down a segment of line, the failure does not propagate to the entire line and it's somewhat contained to uh, you know, a limited number of spans. Also noteworthy is our emergency response program, which positions us to better prepare for and react to major events. Uh, conceptually, I suppose one might consider additional risk mitigation, such as designing stronger infrastructure, but there is a cost to do this and uh, we have a responsibility to balance costs and performance. Uh, so perhaps a more suitable risk mitigation approach, if you wanted to take things further, uh, is to improve the monitoring and the ability to react. Uh, from a systemic risk perspective, we recognize, uh, you know, geographically separating this illustrative new line from existing infrastructure does offer some resilience as some of these acute events of interest, uh, let's just say tornadoes, for example, uh, they might have localized impacts that are unlikely to affect infrastructure that is separated by many kilometers, or maybe just less likely to affect infrastructure uh, separated by great distances. So some of these in-depth discussions uh, may not leave us with very obvious or suitable risk treatment options, um, but what I found is that in many cases, uh, we refine scientific questions and we can take away these little nuggets to go and study further to help us better understand the risks. Some of the topics may be for subject matter experts to, to look into, such as, you know, what does the system configuration and customer behavior look like in the 2050s and in the 2080s? Uh, are we expecting some customers to have solar panels on their homes that might actually alleviate the peak electrical demand on those plus 40 degree days or the hours of the day where it's over 40 degrees Celsius and the sun is shining bright? And then from the climate science perspective, um, this gives us ideas for research and development type projects where we can engage with external researchers to explore specific topics or even undertake some of our own internal analyses, such as using uh, you know, sub daily or, or hourly data from a regional climate model to explore how many hours per year uh, those high heat and low wind events um, may persist for. Uh, to me, this is the, the real leading edge of research application uh, and one of those, uh, you know, one of the most interesting elements of my work. Uh, it's also the intersect where we get to work with organizations like Uranos, uh, which brings me to my next slide on lessons learned. So there are lots, um, but I just wanted to share a few um, just to stress the importance of being pragmatic. So managing weather-related risk is not a new concept at Manitoba Hydro. It's not a new concept to, to many electrical utilities. Um, and it's important to recognize that there are existing assets, operations, and processes in place that can contribute to resilience. So I think it's important to look at climate change risk and resilience, but it's also important to look at what we're already doing. Um, I found it extremely helpful to explicitly address historic likelihood, future likelihoods, and the confidence in the projected change. And I think this is a very practical way to communicate with the designers, the engineers, the planners. Um, and uh, it beats the approach of trying to lump in some of these things, but having an actual categorical assignment of confidence and you know, likelihoods, this is a, a useful approach. Uh, and then finally, I think collaboration is is paramount. Uh, so the icons here show a sample of some of our collaborators that uh, we've either worked with in the past, or we are currently working with, uh, and research partners like Aranis, uh, well, they can support the climate science and the likelihood side of the risk equation. Uh, and then we have industry partners like Curt and OPG, uh, which can support the um, exploration of impact side of the equation and you know perhaps some adaptation approaches and adaptation planning procedures. So in summary, uh, I'd like to reflect on the five points presented in the outline, just a brief statement. Uh, number one, Manitoba Hydro is sensitive to weather, climate, and changes there too. Number two, we have a handful of strategies to help guide us with respect to climate change. Uh, 
Number three, a multidisciplinary group has been tasked with the climate change risk assessment, and, and that is the core working group that I mentioned. Number four, we strive to be pragmatic, recognizing that climate change adaptation takes thoughtful consideration. Uh, and number five, Canadian electrical utilities, uh, including but not limited to Manitoba Hydro, have some unique considerations, uh, and that's what makes my job incredibly interesting. So I just wanted to say thank you very much again for the opportunity to present, and I think we have some time for questions, but I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Marco. Thank you, Mike. Uh, that was great. Um, yeah, so I'll uh, ask the audience online, do you have questions? Uh, please feel free to raise your hand, uh, ask your questions or, or post it in the chat. Oh, we have uh, Marie-Claude. Marie-Claude, do you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you, Marco. Uh, thank you, Mike, for this uh, great presentation. I have some uh, um, uh, question for you about uh, uh, in the framework that you present for your risk analysis, uh, do you uh, tackle the problem of dam safety issues? And uh, uh, about, the, I think you mentioned the uh, inflow design flood and how you incorporate uh, climate change since there's a, a, a really uh, long lifespan. So uh, I, I just want to have your thoughts on, on this and how did you uh, address uh, uh, the problem if you add it yeah that, that's a that's a great question so um i think i'm unmuted sorry um so the concept or the question of dam safety and inflow design floods that's come up multiple times so uh one in our cora working group um the survey that i mentioned that was one of the topics brought up um so that was more of a, a risk identification and you know initial risk assessment phase so we haven't gotten into the details uh, but what we suspect is going to happen now that we're processing some of the feedback we received in that survey is uh, that is likely going to be one of the higher priority items for us to look in look into given the the importance of it um, a second note on that is the the middle project which i alluded to which was you know increasing uh, generation capacity at an existing generating station uh, we certainly looked into some projections of you know future extreme floods and um, generally speaking, there's not a lot of confidence in how that's projected to change. So if we were to follow Environment and Climate Change Canada's sort of tier rating system, uh, it would be more of a tier three type variable. Um, and that's due to, to many factors, um, you know, if, especially if we're talking about changes in a 1000 or less frequent event, uh, there's a lot of uncertainties, um, but uh, what we did do is looked at a bit of a sensitivity analysis to see how the existing infrastructure could manage a flood that changed by a certain degree and that was informed by climate model simulations Great. thank you mike and if you uh, and uh, uh if i can open the door and for you and kurt uh, we will gladly uh, collaborate with you guys on those uh, dam safety issues and uh, uh, how do we uh, do we put uh, together uh, maybe a, a some a task force about about this? So uh, we'll talk uh, maybe next year about it. Thank you. That's, that sounds wonderful. Thank you. Great. Um, Maria Maria Obiarnia, you have a question. Do you want to ask it yourself? Thank you, Marco. Well, first of all, congratulations, Mike. I really love the presentation. Um, my question is more related to um, the quantitative evaluation of the risk. So you say, well, you do all the calculations, you come up with a risk, and then you talk with the experts to say, to categorize it as, as it is acceptable or not acceptable for them. But is there, or are you considering any kind of threshold to the definition of what it is resilience or not resilience? What is acceptable or not acceptable in risk? Yeah, th this is this is a really great question, and the answer that it, it's sort of a, a blended approach. Um, you know, we we do try to quantify it to some degree um, by considering risk as a function of you know the impact and the future likelihood, uh, but then we use additional items to help interpret, or sorry, additional information to help interpret that risk. So that information is. Um, you know, the overall risk rating, which uh, in the example that I provided uh, could have been moderate or low. 
Uh, and then we consider our tolerance to changes in such events. Uh, we consider you know, some of the professional judgment that the asset operators and owners bring to the table. And we consider the confidence in the future projected change when we interpret it together. But it, it's definitely a bit subjective. Um, we rely heavily on subject matter experts and their understanding of how we would uh, ultimately respond to or react to, to this type of climate change projected event. Um, so it's a bit of a blend between quantitative and qualitative. Um, thank you. Um, there is a question from Ernesto Rodriguez. Re Ernesto, do you want to ask your question yourself? Okay, sure, Marco. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Mike, for your insightful presentation. Uh, my question is about how does Manitoba Hydro consider the impact of climate change, not only on the operation, but also on the company supply and value chain. That means, for example, the relation with the stakeholders, employee, and other levels of the operation company. Thanks so much. Yeah, another really good question. Uh, and, and I didn't dive too deep into the topic of what makes that impact category. Uh, but generally speaking, there, there's a number of different aspects within that impact category, which we would use to, you know, assign, a, you know, basically a low to a high sort of impact rating. Um, one of those is financial. That's generally what we, we always lean to because we like speaking in terms of dollars. But there's definitely environmental, there's customers, there's operations, uh, and there's human resources as well. So our staff and, and you know, the ability to retain staff, engagement, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and then a big component there as well is also health and safety. So, you know, if we're talking about extreme heat events, one of the items that we've looked into is, okay, how do workers in the field manage that additional stress from those plus 40 days and what sort of things are at their disposal to, to help manage it? So it's, it's embedded. I didn't dive into it in deep, deep detail, but it's certainly part of the, um, of the conversation and uh, maybe just to build on that one step further within the core working group uh, we have broad representation which includes you know the the more so the engineering design planning components that i've presented today but also you know groups responsible for human resources and customers and uh, customer relations corporate communications and those other elements as well so we, we try to capture it but uh yeah today's presentation was a bit focused okay um, with your point about workers in the field and exposure, uh, maybe uh, that might lead over to uh, uh, a bit larger question by uh, Sherin Akari uh, again about compound events. Uh, Sherin, do you want to ask your question again? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mike, for your excellent presentation. My question is, you have talked during your presentation about uh, systemic versus direct risk. I'm wondering how can, in the future maybe, how can we integrate compound event uh, in the risk assessment? Yeah, um, so, so when we sit down with, uh, with engineers and project folks and subject matter experts, we try to identify you know, the specific events that are of interest. Um, generally, we tend towards those related to temperature and precipitation, but we mm -hmm. recognize that there's, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, so, so one of the events that I've, I presented today is that extreme heat coincident with low wind speed event. So that's something that was identified and that's we, tried to, we tried to provide some context on mm -hmm. um, in, in our you know, consideration of the climate science, historic mm -hmm. changes and future likelihood. Uh, and that's how it's considered in, in our risk assessment process. Um, I'm not too sure how that really links to the direct versus systemic risk. Some of these topics, um, you know, they impact the project that we're talking about, but they also impact the, the broader system as a whole. And when we're speaking about, you know, transmission line development, um, sure, we have some risks uh, for the new project. We also have risks for existing transmission lines, um, but the presence of additional routes to move that electricity, uh, generally speaking, alleviates risks on the entire system. So it can be seen as a, an opportunity. Um, there's a lot of redundancy that's built into the transmission system for reliability purposes. Um, so if a specific asset is impacted, um, having additional assets to move that electricity is seen as a, as a positive thing from an operational perspective. Perspective. 
Great, thank you very much. Okay, um, I think Sarah Claude, your question is kind of in the same line of variables of interest um, or coincident variables of interest. Uh, do you want to ask your question? I don't know, maybe it was already answered. Yes, it was already answered, thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm checking the chat. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. In the audience, do we have uh, another question? I have another question, Mike. Uh, I would like to know your thing or your view about the use of risk metrics or risk metrics. Uh, do you think it's the optimal tool for risk management decisions? Because normally, in all our standards, they are quite used, but I think that we have to try to create a new ways to uh, evaluate to assess the risk, not you only use it the, the metrics risk. Thanks. Yeah, that, that that's a good question. Um, we've we've used the risk assessment like the traditional risk assessment process because that's what's specified in the climate lens document, and that's what we we need to do to to meet these these criteria for completing a climate change resilience assessment. Uh, but certainly, there there are many different ways you could do this. Um, I I think we're all probably fairly familiar with the decision making under deep uncertainty type approaches and and I think that's that's a really interesting way to do risk informed sensitivity analyses and and project uh, analysis um, but we haven't used that extensively ourselves um, personally speaking uh, if you were to start with you know the risk assessment process outlined in ISO 31000 it's very very basic um, and not directly applicable to a climate change resilience assessment process. And I've really advocated for, you know, consideration of historic likelihood, future likelihoods, uh, and this consideration of uncertainty to some degree, because I think that's an incredibly important part of the, the question. Um, you know, we, we may look at climate projections and they, they may say one thing and they may have this huge, um, you know, band around them of, of uncertainty in the projections and that makes things very difficult for a decision maker especially when you're talking about huge investments in electrical infrastructure using public money effectively um, so if we can you know slowly improve upon those methods uh, and make it easier to use some of the more complex methods like decision making under deep uncertainty i think that's a step in the in the right direction okay thank you so much Mike. Okay, um, maybe maybe a, a little bit in connection with that, um, the sources that you use uh, for the type of assessment, uh, the risk assessment and the analysis that you do, um, um, actually both of you, Kurt and, and, and Mike, you both presented that you um, relied on multiple sources, uh, the, the CREDA documents, the climate lens, um, IPCC reports and so forth. It's a, a panoply of, of sources that you use. Um, and uh, then you, you, you uh, boil that down to something that's specific for your environment, specific for your enterprise or assets. Um, do you think it would be useful or even possible to have a sort of a, sort of a Lord of the Rings, a Lord of the Guides, um, um, ultimate uh, guide to rule them all? Um, um, or is it more useful to actually pick from multiple sources and have multiple approaches that you that you uh, pin together uh, um, to do what you did? So, so I can start. Uh, really good question, Marco. And it's actually something we've we've discussed in, in other forums. Um, I, I didn't show a photo of it, but there is a document by CEA on a, a climate adaptation guide process developed for the electricity industry. And uh, we had many similar discussions during that development. And uh, it seemed to be that the consensus was that there was a preference for a high level approach uh, so that each individual company could take this and merge it with existing risk management processes. Uh, so there was a preference to be less prescriptive in how to do things and more generic. Uh, but with that said, uh, it's very, very helpful to have, you know, this toolkit of different documents to pull from. 
And what I found incredibly helpful is a, a document like that produced by Uranos. It was the, the hydropower evaluation or hydropower asset evaluation guide, which gives us a, a tool that we can use within the larger risk assessment framework to understand the impacts of changing stream flows on our hydroelectric assets. So I, to me, I think that type of guidance is incredibly useful. Um, I think it'd be, uh, yeah, like you say, a Lord of the Rings type uh, compendium if we were to try to capture it all in one report. Maybe uh, uh, bring Kurt back into the discussion. Uh, Kurt, do you have a, uh, a take on that? Yeah, I was gonna kind of echo Mike's uh, sentiment. If it was gonna be the kind of the one guide to rule them all, I, I imagine it would be uh, incredibly thick and maybe never read. Um, I, I do like this idea of maybe more of a, an ecosystem. And that's one of the things that we're hoping to put together even within our own sort of uh, resilience guide is consider it a framework, right? So you, you have the structure, you have the bones that you can follow. You, you've got some uh, good guidance on using uh, particular methods, but the method that you might land on for a simple project um, could be very effective and very easy to do compared to something that is much more complicated. And so you have to have something that has the, the ability to scale. So to some extent, you're always going to have to be making some uh, expert judgments on what is appropriate uh, based on the problem that you're, you're dealing with. So that kind of the one guide to rule them all could actually get um, kind of unendingly complicated. Uh, but what I think is, is good is to have maybe the web together, right? Because this is what we don't have, is we have a series of sort of discrete documents. Some of them um, fit together better or worse than others, but we don't really see that sort of the web picture of, of what fits into what piece, which, which gaps are being filled by which documents. And certainly that's constantly evolving with new research. Okay. Um, we have a, a half a minute, a minute left. Uh, I'll, I'll still... Uh, take a risk here and uh, uh, ask an, another quick question. Very briefly, uh, Kurt, you mentioned it in the chat, the question about monitoring and success of adaptation. I think that's a big one. Um, um, just uh, are you already doing something in terms of evaluating the success of adaptation uh, to determine uh, or avoid over under adaptation? In French, we uh, have the nice word of maladaptation. Um, yeah, we're not currently doing that, but I think this ties into almost Ernesto's question earlier is I, I think we do need to um, get to the idea of more of what is an adaptation metric. Um, and I, I completely missed the opportunity when you mentioned that earlier. I think that's still something that's very much top of mind for us. So for example, do I have a risk today or is climate change gonna be a risk for me in 2040? I don't need to do something today to still be resilient in the future because I have time to make that decision. So how do we put those together into a kind of a risk management decision-making framework? How do we have a metric that says kind of how resilient we are, given that I might not need to do anything right now to still be resilient? Um, so that's uh, probably a good topic of research going forward as well. Mike, you uh, have a, maybe a last comment on that? Yeah, no, I agree with with what Kurt said. Um, that's a that's a big question: is how do you define a climate resilience metric and track progress towards adaptation? Uh, incredibly tough to do, um, and it really needs you to tease out exactly what you did that's different than the existing process that was the adaptation piece and measure the value of that when you encounter chronic changes or acute events. Um, yeah, incredibly challenging. I, I think that's a, a great research question, uh, and I'd love to hear the answer if anyone has it. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, there's uh, a lot of room for thought in the future.